and Swakam uh, Kingdom. Hi everybody. Uh, thanks a lot for joining me uh, this morning. Huge thanks to Jane and Joy for organizing this. Uh, we chatted on the radio yesterday about uh, how she worked hard to make sure we had an event this year to celebrate Literature and Earth Day. I was very fortunate to be a part of the in-person uh, Mattawa River Writers Festival last year and I had a really great time. It's really nice to be out there uh, in the park, uh, being by the river and just celebrating our natural surroundings and the stories that uh, help our uh, our stories thrive essentially, right? So it was a really cool event. Um, I was disappointed to hear that the, the event wasn't able to go ahead in person this year, but like everything else, uh, we're pivoting online for the time being. And I think Dan and Joy has done a wonderful job making sure that we have uh, an ability to come together at least for the day um, and at least virtually. I think um, it's really neat that we have the technologies to be able to, to do this. and. Um, I think it gives the uh, writers, uh, I guess, a bit of a wider reach, too, because we don't all have to drive to Mattawa. We can all sit at home or sit in our backyards and enjoy the, uh, I guess, um, sort of winter weather in the early spring right now. It's, it's about minus two in Sudbury at the moment, so I like, have to get a bit of a heavier jacket on to come outside here. But the sun's shining, so I can't complain at all, and the wind, the wind is uh, relatively uh, mild, so... It's a nice uh, morning to be out here with you all as we transition into the afternoon, Eastern time anyway. I understand some of, many of you will be in other time zones in other parts of the country. So thanks a lot, Chmiigwech, for making the time to hang out with us today. Uh, so when, when I was approached about joining this, I thought it was a really cool opportunity to, to highlight um, some of the ways that the land and nature uh, have inspired me to be a storyteller. And uh, I wanted to make sure I was able to come into my backyard uh, here in Sudbury to do that and I was a little worried that given the temperature the battery might die but it looks like we're holding up okay so if uh, it does sort of deplete quickly I'll just run inside and uh, I'll ask you to bear with me while I make some tracks there uh, but yeah this is uh, where I live um, sort of close-ish to downtown Sudbury and the beauty of living in Sudbury is that it's a very green city despite some stereotypes or some uh, past history of industrialization uh, there have been some really great regreening efforts going on in the city. Um, millions upon millions of trees have been planted in the past 40 years. And as a result, today, uh, we're fortunate to live in a city that has a lot of um, water, easily accessible water, a lot of trails, a lot of parks. And uh, yeah, we, we are just like a 10-minute walk from downtown Sudbury, and we have, you know, a sort of nice backyard here that uh, goes f further into the bush there. So this is uh, not unlike the settings that I grew up in. And it kind of blows my mind that I'm downtown in a city and I have, uh, you know, this peace and quiet um, literally right in my backyard, right? So uh, we've lived in this house for uh, about a year and a half now. Um, it, we're still pretty early uh, in this home ownership journey. Uh, we do plan on being here for a long time. I haven't done any significant writing here yet, but I've got everything that I need, right? And that was a big uh, selling factor for us is just having... Um, this accessible uh, green space um, right, right in our backyard. So I will be um, taking advantage of this as much as I can as I continue my writing journey. And uh, I'll take a, I'll show you a little bit. There's a little shed just over here and I might be doing my writing in there. Uh, we'll see. Um, we have a baby coming in June. So uh, in, in the event that I'm able to, you know, put the put the baby to sleep and make sure our to toddlers are occupied, I've been eyeballing the space in there. So there's some nice high work benches where I could stand and type if I need to. So um, I think I'm in I'm in uh, good shape here to to get some further writing done. And if I need to, just step out here and and really enjoy uh, enjoy my surroundings. And I guess uh, to, to carry on with the theme, um, that's really what my background is is being in the bush. I grew up in Wasoxing First Nation, which is near Perry Sound, Ontario. Uh, my parents were living in Ottawa uh, when they learned that I was coming, and they decided that uh, they wanted to raise their kids on the res, uh, on the land. And um, I'm always grateful. I feel like that was a very fortunate decision for me in growing up in my community and growing up on the land and being really connected to my surroundings as an Anishinaabe person. And my parents made a big sacrifice to do that. They left their city life and wanted to, you know, spend, you know, the following decades on the res so that they could raise their kids, uh, much like my dad grew up. Because my dad's from Wasoxing and my mom's from Perry Sound and originally from Cabot Chasing here in Northern Ontario. So I've got roots here and I'm really proud to be in Northern Ontario. And um, 
uh, yeah, just sort of carrying on that legacy of, of natural storytelling and just being in the elements and, and really celebrating them too. So yeah, the house I grew up in was a pretty humble house, you know, like uh, my parents built it on their own. Um, we spent probably the first eight or nine years of my life uh, without hydro or running water because um, that's just how my parents chose to, for us to live. And, you know, my earliest memories are of chopping woods and hauling it inside pumping water from the well outside and hauling it inside, you know, going out to um, the bay, to the cove on the bay with my dad to pull in a net, uh, to pull in fish. Uh, that's what we ate most of the time. And occasionally going out hunting with my dad and my uncles too. So that's the upbringing I had. And I, I feel very fortunate to have begun my life that way. Um, even though I've been an urban person for uh, 22 years now, um, those are my fondest memories. And I think having that basis, that foundation really set me up to be, uh, I guess, um, uh, an effective storyteller in some ways, because we learned early on as Nishaba kids that that was what, you know, kept our stories alive was our connection to the land itself, right? So um, the, the way I really got into storytelling was, you know, growing up in the 1980s at a time where our community was really reconnecting with Nishnabe culture and history and um, language. You know, um, obviously, like many other Indigenous communities, uh, people, you know, in our First Nation were dealing with the uh, effects of colonialism, you know, the sort of impacts of forced assimilation, uh, the legacies of residential schools and day schools, uh, intergenerational trauma, um, the uh, forbidding elements of the Indian Act that really suppressed culture. Um, so after a few decades of, of some, some trauma, essentially, a bunch of uh, people in my parents' generation came together and really made an effort to reconnect with uh, their Anishinaabe background and make sure that we kids of that generation grew up knowing who we were as Anishinaabe, right? And what some of those stories were and what the language and culture and history were of, of our people of that particular um, part of the land, of, of the North Shore of Georgian Bay and Lake Huron. So going to school on the res uh, meant that we often had elders come in to tell us stories. You know, we would maybe be doing math class and then an elder who would be happen, happen to walk by on the main road would come into the school and sit down with us. And then, you know, we'd put all the lessons on hold and we'd spend however long the elder wanted to spend with us, right? And, you know, whoever that was would tell us about our history, would tell us about our culture, would share like a creation story of how some things came to be. And um, would just make us really proud to be Nishnabek, right? And that was a, a fairly revolutionary thing at the time because it wasn't until much later on into adulthood when I started to meet other people from other First Nations when I moved to Toronto, like in an urban setting, that um, that was a bit of an anomaly. You know, we were fortunate to have this movement in our community where people really wanted to connect with, uh, with their culture. So what that involved also was leaving the classroom and going out into the bush. If an elder decided that we needed to go out and look for some medicine, or if we needed to go out and look at some natural elements to explain their background, we would go out with the elder. And often our teachers took us out to do that too, right? So they really um, incorporated that into the curriculum in, in really powerful ways so that we um, grew up with that foundational knowledge. And again, I've, I've mentioned this many times, but I'll always be, be grateful for that. So I think for me, that's always been my refuge, right? Is to go out into the bush, you know, to take some time to just be amongst the trees and the rocks or to sit by the water and uh, sort of reconnect. And I, I wouldn't say that I do any actual writing in those moments, like putting sort of words onto a screen or stringing sentences together. But that's really where the ideas come from, right? Um, so if, if I'm really uh, trying to push a story forward or trying to dream up details of a character or, or trying to you know, work out some uh, elements of the plot and I may be stuck, uh, what I'll do is I'll just sort of find some green space or find a trail or, or find a place in the bush to sit in and just spend however long I need to there. And, and the things will come to me, you know? And I think I've, I've been uh, fortunate to have that, that connection and that knowledge that that is my safe space, that is my refuge, and that's where I will always draw inspiration. So, you know, that's harder to do in a city, and I've done most of my literary writing in, in places like Winnipeg and Ottawa when I lived and worked there as a journalist. 
so I'd make an effort to, to find a place uh, to go to, to spend some time. Uh, but fortunately, I'm also still very closely connected to my home community of Wissaxing. And within the last five years, my wife and I have been uh, working on a cabin there that we're able to spend the summers at. So that's really one of my important refuges as well. And we built that cabin um, along the shore of Georgian Bay, uh, where my grandmother used to have like her sort of summer um, retreat, right? She used to have a cabin down there. So with her blessing before she died, she allowed us to, to build a cabin there as well. So that's where we go. And I just feel very grateful that I have that space that, you know, that family uh, area is still available to me and that it will be for, you know, my kids and, and their kids and for, for generations to come. Right. And that's sort of one of the greatest gifts that my grandmother and my family by extension really gave to me is just having that, that connection. So whenever we go there, we only go there in the summertime right now because it's not quite winterized yet, but whenever we go, I do take my laptop and once in a while I'll, I'll, bust it out and try to write some things down but um yeah I'd, I'd, I'd sort of rather not actually write in in those settings so i just sort of rather feel like the inspiration of of the place and really uh allow it to feed my spirit and and sort of uh sponge up that energy i guess of being in that place so you know uh, whatever comes to mind while i'm sitting there once i come out of it you know i obviously still have like a, a smartphone in my pocket at all times right so you know i'll make a note of i have a whole file of like ideas like writing ideas right so i'll make a note of uh what came to me at that particular moment and then when it comes time to write um write something out or write something down uh i'll, I'll sort of pull out the phone and check out that note and sort of expand on that particular idea um on top of that, uh, it's not always easy for all of us as, as writers or storytellers, like no, no, no matter where we're from or who we are or what part of the journey we're on, it's not always easy for us to find green space, right? And I think a lot of uh, people in, in urban centers uh, may have that difficulty too. So I think for me, it is a privilege to be able to have this access still. But at the same time, what a lot of uh, a lot of my, I guess, bigger ideas came from just walking around the city, you know. So if you can't get to a green space, I, I you know, I always like to just walk around the city however much I can and, and sort of let the ideas sort of come to me. And um, when I was working in Ottawa, when I was thinking mostly about Moon of the Crescent Snow, um, as, as sort of that story was coming to me, I had a, about a 17 minute walk to CBC. So the whole time walking to and from work, so that's, you know, more than half an hour a day, I would devote my, I would switch sort of the moon of the crescent snow. Uh, I'd flip that switch in my brain and just think about that constantly on the walk there and the walk back. Because it's pretty much impossible to think about anything else when you're working as a daily journalist, right? Like you're on your daily assignment and you're, um, have, have a whole bunch of balls in the air that you got to juggle to get a story done or to get multiple stories done. And, um, you know, you just don't have that time during that eight or nine hour shift to really think about much else other than your story. Right. So, um, I sort of tried to, uh, use as much available time as I had to me, uh, to sort of think about the story. And, uh, yeah, a lot of that was during my walk to work. So, uh, what I like to advise people who, who are working on stories is, you know, that, that commute or that walk to your day job is some essential time really to get to a story developed and to sort of work on some elements like character or plot or, or setting or anything else like that. So uh, yeah, I use my walking time primarily for that. So if you can chart out like um, a, a greener walking path uh, wherever you live, I think that's helpful too. Uh, but you know, when I was in, in Ottawa, I basically just walked up Bank Street, right? Which is pretty much downtown of the city you know, with buses going by and people, you know, uh, bureaucrats, you know, rushing to and from their jobs every day. So I guess it was important to tune things out, but just breathe the fresh air, I think. So um, I think that's where a lot of, uh, a, lot, a lot of the natural elements um, that really fuel my storytelling come from. It's just trying to make the most of what's available to me and um, really just being uh, a human on the land and understanding um, our relationship with the land. Um, I think that's a connection that a lot of us have lost for various reasons and primarily due to the fact that, you know, capitalism and colonialism have shifted our view of land 
into something more uh, into a spirit of, of exploitation, essentially, and into um, something that we live on and take from, but not necessarily live with. So those are Nishnabe values that uh, some Nishnabe values that I was raised with um, uh, echo the need to be with the land and to be a part of it and to understand that, you know, we only take as much from it as we need and we really understand our place with the land and, and with each other and that it's all about relationships, right? And that being out on the land is, is a privilege, but, but it's also, uh, you know, a right for us as, as humans as, as part of life um, to be there and to have access to it. So there's been a disconnect um, due largely to, you know, the land being exploited, you know, over the past 200, 300 years. But hopefully we're in a time now where we're able to make that, that connection again and that, you know, some core values, and they're not just Nishnabe values, right? Like, I think those are core human values as well. It's to just uh, respect and appreciate life and just to be a part of it and understand who we are with it. Um, so yeah, I think hopefully during this weird time that we're going through, um, we're going to be able to uh, understand that connection again, um, even though we are, most of us are isolated in our own homes and <laughs> we can't necessarily get out as much as we used to. But um, the fact that everything's calming down on the land and, and in our communities uh, sort of speaks to the fact that, you know, life is allowed to thrive again. And, and you're seeing a lot of natural elements really uh, become themselves and, and get out. And, you know, we're seeing all these pictures and videos shared of, of animals, you know, taking over parts of cities. I just saw this video today of uh, a family of foxes in the beaches part of Toronto, I think, near that boardwalk there, right? So that's really cool. You know, like you can't help but be heartwarmed when you see something like that. So I think, uh, I think I'll just leave it there for now. I'm sure you all have a lot of questions. Uh, and I'm happy to chat with you. You know, I'm here for the next 25 minutes. So whatever questions you have, um, just feel free to shoot them. And if you run out of questions, uh, I've got a lot more I could talk about, but I'm more interested in hearing from you and for having a conversation with you too. So all available right. for questions. That That's, thank you so much, Wab. I keep on thinking about the connection to the land keeps our stories alive and it's so perfect to see you standing outside on the land and sharing your stories. Um, Bill has written the relationship with nature and your walks. Although restricted right now, where are your walks taking to you to in your next round of writing? Ah, good, uh, good question. Um, so we um like i walk every day to work to cbc still even though that's going downtown but um we found like my family and i have found uh well we haven't found it we've just gone there more more often recently there's a park called fielding park in the um, west end of sudbury and uh it's it's pretty wide open you know the trails are fairly large you know there's enough space there to maintain a safe physical distance and uh here in sudbury whoops i just lost my uh here in Sudbury, the uh, parks aren't shut down, like they're still accessible to us, just as long as we're able to, to keep a distance. Um, so that's where we've been doing some walking as a family. And, uh, you know, what I'm thinking of now is, I guess, where I, I take the Moon of the Crescent Stove story next. And um, the, the, that's sort of the world that I'm sort of jumping back into at the moment. And I'm not really sure where that's going to, to go or how that story is going to evolve. Um, but that's where my walks are and that's where my head is at the moment. And obviously I'm thinking a lot of my family. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear um, <laughs> my little guy's a little upset right now about something. So he's outside. My, my mom is here. Uh, she came to help us out because, uh, you know, my wife Sarah and I are both working, obviously. And uh, daycare has been closed for about a month now. So thankfully my mom has come in to help. And uh, but I think it might be close to lunchtime and he might be hungry, which is why you heard him crying there. But yeah, so that's, uh, that's where my walks are and that's where my head is. Wob, uh, there's a question from Terry Campbell, who is going to be leading our storytelling oh, cool. shop later. And she asks, do you ever orally rehearse any of the stories you end up writing? Because your writing is so vibrant and it seems to come from the spoken word. Oh, thanks, Terry. That's a really great question, actually. And uh, I can talk a bit about how Moon of the Crescent Snow came together um, in that sense of like a, an oral tradition. Uh, I, I, I didn't used to, honestly. Like I didn't, uh, when I wrote, I didn't speak as I was writing. 
and that's something they teach us in broadcasting, right? Is to always speak as you're writing because you're going to have to say those things eventually. So you may as well practice as you're writing, right? But I always had that sort of uh, detachment between my journalism writing and, you know, what I was trying to do with sort of literary writing, eh? So I never really practiced that at all. And I think that was probably to my detriment too. And I should note that I, I, you know, I'm still learning as an author, right? I still consider myself an emerging writer um, because, you know, there, there's a lot I still need to learn. So I didn't apply that principle to literary writing at all when I really should have the whole time. And, and thankfully, um, through the editing process with Moon of the Crescent Snow, my editor, Susan Renouf, said, um, you know, she would look at the, these big, long chunks of ex exposition and she would say, you know, like, why don't you just try to chop that down a bit? And, and sort of use your skills as a broadcast journalist and, and write things that way. So as a result, we really pared down a lot of that uh, manuscript um, to, to make it a little more, not necessarily forceful, but succinct and to make it a little more efficient in terms of um, telling the story. Hey, buddy, do you want to say hi? Here. No. Oh, we don't? Okay. Maybe he'll <laughs> say hi later. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, and she said, you know, like, um, you, you come from an oral tradition, an oral storytelling tradition of your people. And um, why don't you, you know, keep that spirit alive within your own man manuscript? Do you want to say hi now? <laughs> yeah, okay. I'll lift you up. Ugh. This is Jequis. Say hi. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's hanging out with grandma in the backyard here. Um, so, yeah, it was... Uh, it wasn't necessarily a challenge to do that. It was just, you know, flipping a switch in my mind. And Susan really helped me do that, mm -hmm. um, which was great. And I think as a result, the story is, uh, well, the, the writing in the story is a lot stronger because, you know, it, the, it has a slightly punchier delivery. And it's something that I can speak, you know. It's something that I can say and I'm comfortable to do it. So, uh, yeah, um, I always give credit to Susan for, you know, opening that part of my mind to, to my writing. And um Hopefully, uh, I'll continue along that path in that spirit. Next question from Kelly. How can we celebrate Earth Day every day? Ah, great question. Um, you know, I think the, the easiest way, well, the, you know, the, the, the most straightforward way, if we can, is to um, carry on the spirit like we're doing today and, and sort of celebrating the outdoors and nature and getting outside. And uh, just being, you know, amongst rocks and trees and water, if we're able to, right, and, and appreciating that. And it's, that's not necessarily anything that active that we have to do. Um, we don't have to sort of make anything or sort of make any sort of uh, statements or, you know, initiatives known. Just, just being in the, on the land and in it and appreciating it, I think, is, is a good way to keep that spirit alive. And, and as mentioned, it's not always possible, especially for those of us in cities, but I think um, it, it's part, it comes down to like mindfulness that we hear a lot about these days. Eh? And, and that's like just being aware of your surroundings and being aware of your presence in, in this world and, and what you're a part of and what's all around you, I think is, is really important. So, you know, on top of that, taking a more active role would be like supporting initiatives uh, like the Canadian Ecology Center that uh, ensure, you know, we have um, good, natural, clean, safe surroundings around us. And, and also just, uh, you know, letting our, our peers and our families know that uh, we're fortunate, especially those, especially us in, in most of Canada, to have access to a lot of this space, right? And, and here in Northern Ontario, for sure. So, yeah, I guess the short answer would be just, just be mindful of our position, of our place, and, and what we have available to us, and just be thankful for it. Next question from Bob is, have you tried writing in Anishinaabe? Now there's some vocabulary, and this is me, and there's some vocabulary in Moon of the Crusted Snow, but have you actually tried to, and, and you are taking some language lessons too, I think, right? Yeah. Yeah, good question. No, I haven't. Um, I just, I don't have the skills to write anything fluently because I'm not a fluent speaker yet. Um, uh, I do uh, hope to be a fluent speaker someday, maybe many years from now, like five to 10 years, uh, because it is a long journey. Um, I've been around the language my whole life, like I grew up hearing it, but I just didn't learn it properly, you know, due to a lot of the uh, impacts of shame that um, were a result of colonialism, right? Like there was a shame attached to the language for a long time, which is why it wasn't effectively passed down to us, although it was shared with us, with my generation in sort of little nuggets, but uh, it wasn't enough for us to, to each learn, you know, fluently or properly. So 
you know, so it's been a lifelong journey for me. I've had, you know, I've restarted my learning journey many, many times. Like I've lost count of how many times I sat down and said, okay, this is the time I'm going to start learning it fluently, right? You know, other things come in the way and I just uh, have never made it a priority as much as I should. Um, and part of the transition I'm making to, to, to moving on from CBC is to make more space and more time for that. But the hope, I guess, someday would be to be able to write a fully formed story in the Shnab Um That'll be a long time, but uh, that's a goal I've set for myself, for sure. And, um, you know, hopefully it's, it's something that will eventually happen. But there's a lot of work I need to do still, you know, and there's, I think, a lot of um, work that governments need to do in making language more accessible and making sure that younger generations have the ability to learn it fluently because, there aren't enough resources out there, especially within the formal education system. Um, so hopefully we'll get there, but I appreciate the question. It's a good reminder it's a good to, to stay motivated on a personal level. Mm -hmm. And for your son, you've been teaching him. Yeah, yeah, he, he probably like, you know, he has a, he has a very limited vocabulary, but um, you know, it'll come to the point where his vocabulary is better than mine because I probably have about a two year old, uh, <laughs> comprehension of the language and he's three now so when I if I keep it up and he ends up going to hopefully if there's ever like a fluent um you know a, an immersion program that comes to Sudbury he'll surpass me sooner than uh, sooner than later but um you know we'll see and yeah that is that is the big motivator is having kids you know making sure that uh, they are able to speak it and they have it available to them going forward oh I have a stick oh miigwech buddy <laughs> See, and he brought me a stick, so here we go. Excellent. Hey, you don't say stick? You don't say stick in the schnabe? It's in the tig. Can you say the tig? The tig. Okay. He's using it as uh, some kind of weapon now. He's, he's going like that. So. <laughs> um, we have a question from Pamela. She asks, um, Wob, in Moon of the Crested Snow, you reveal how communities can pull apart or come together in a crisis. As a writer, what do you imagine this crisis will change in our communities and what are you hopeful for? Oh, good question, Pamela. Um, I think that's, that's probably the, the, the biggest parallel I've seen personally between what we're going through now and what happens in Moon of the Crescent Snow. Um, my hope is that it would bring people together and, and sort of broaden their perspective about our place on this land, right? Uh, because that's what happens to, to most of the characters in the story is that they um, realize how fragile, you know, the, our technologies really are and how fragile our systems and societies really are and how we're pretty much on the brink more so than we, than we recognize, right? And the ones who are more able to adapt in Moon of the Crest and Snow are the ones who have the closer connection with the land and with each other and with their heritage as not necessarily stewards of the land, but good citizens of the land, right? People who are able to work together to make good things happen and to make sure that life carries on in a positive way, despite all the turmoil going on around them. So my hope is that we emulate something like that. You know, we don't necessarily see it happening, you know, especially with people panic buying up grocery stores and, mm. you know, south of the border, you know, protests, you know, happening where people are, <laughs> sort of uh, defying physical distancing measures and, you know, protesting their governments because they want the economy to start back up, you know, at, at the risk of pretty much everyone else around them, you know. Um, so th those things, you know, give me a bit of pause, a bit of concern. But um, I think, you know, a lot of us are, have a lot of time to, to really ponder our position right now. And, and, you know, you see people posting and, you know, our main method of, of contact with the outside world is seeing what people are posting on social media, right? So, but, you know, in my circles and in sort of the, the realms that I follow on social media, I see a lot of people talking about how they want to learn how to grow food properly, how they want to sort of make that connection and it's sort of uh, I guess develop those skill sets within their own homes and within their circles. And uh, that's really encouraging. And, and I think, you know, the food issue is what's really going to open people's eyes to that because the panic buying is a result of people not having that connection to the food that they eat, you know? Um, most of us, especially those of us who live in cities, are reliant on food coming in from elsewhere. 
um, which is not really a safe way to be if you really think about it. You know, we, we buy our food from some from a, a place that has been serviced by a truck that brought in the food elsewhere. And if that supply chain breaks down, and it is very tenuous, you know, we, we've seen how, how potentially that could be impacted. Um, what are we going to eat, you know? Um, but we actually have lots of resources around us if we're able to make that connection with the land. You know, we have enough food to eat within our, 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 our the radius of our communities to, 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 to thrive, essentially, right? And that's how people have been doing it on this land for thousands of years. But, you know, even a, a lot of Indigenous people who have that background have, have forgotten that as well. So hopefully it, it brings people closer to that realization that if we need to, you know, the land has everything uh, that is required to sustain us. And hopefully this all just inspires people to, as I said, make that connection again and maybe learn some of those skills to help them in their communities. Um, there's a question from, and I don't have their name, it, it's from iPhone. Um, in Moon of the Crusted Snow, the children seem so resilient to all the changes. As a father, how do you think of our current circumstances are, how do you think our current circumstances are affecting our children? Oh, that's a, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a big one to ponder too. Um, I, I guess uh, uh, what our kids will take away the most from this is how we respond to it all, right? And how we react to everything going on around us. And it's hard not to let this, this situation get us down because it is really intense. You know, it's uh, very few of us have gone through something this widespread before, right? And um, it, it's really, uh, putting, you know, as, as I mentioned, our fragility under the magnifying glass. Uh, so it's hard not to break under those circumstances. Like we have had our moments here at home, you know, as, as sort of as strong as we try to present ourselves and as resilient as we try to be, it's, it's going to get you down regardless, right? So, but when I look at my son, who's three, you know, his, his world has changed over the last month, right? Uh, he's not going into daycare anymore. He hasn't seen any of his friends for a month. You know, he's only really seen um, me and, and Sarah, my wife, and now my mom, who's come to help, right? Um, and he knows that whenever we go out in those rare moments that we all go out somewhere, like to the park, you know, he can't touch anything. You know, it's like, don't touch anything, be safe, et cetera, et cetera, right? Uh, but we, how we explain it to him is that there are a lot of people in the world who are sick right now, and we have to do these things to make sure that more people don't get sick. And, and he understands that. And I think... Breaking it down to that really simple message um, is, is what's hopefully going to allow us to have more perspective once again, right? Um, because perhaps we may be overthinking things in a lot of ways, but what we learned from our son especially is that uh, there is still a lot to be joyful for despite what's going on around us. And uh, he still brings this joy every day. He, of course, has his moments of frustration, right? Like he's stuck inside most of the time and you know, we are only getting into spring weather now where he's able to be outside, like, you know, in the backyard there. Um, but yeah, as, as we all know, like the young ones are our greatest teachers and they give us the best perspective. So, you know, I hope that like he will remember this for sure. You know, he's, he's three and a half years old and this will be, you know, a big, a big early memory for him. But um, I hope we remember most of all how our relationship with him and with that generation really evolved and how, um, essentially, he has taught us to be more mindful and more thankful of what we have had, right? Because, you know, hopefully if people do keep adhering to these measures that, you know, this will be somewhat over, that we will return to a new normal uh, someday soon. So I think that's, I think that answers your question. I think that's what you're trying to get at. But that's, that's really what comes to mind when I think about children, for sure. And, and you know, you know, we, I, I just feel hopeful when, when I see him and I feel, you know, encouraged and empowered by, by being his dad, you know, so I'm very thankful for that. Yeah. Um, there's a comment that um, from HMW that we Zoom with grandchildren in Montreal, Ottawa and Sudbury. Technology oh, cool. is good. So it's, it's interesting, you know, with the mindfulness, with how to keep Earth Day every day and you know picking up those you know I, I was i had an interview the other day and 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 they asked um you know what's what's the difference and and it's like you're holding a stick you know that tactile experience mm. you know we're we are each in our own spaces um mm. but hopefully when we 
are able to go out that we are mindful of the smells, the sound, the feeling of the sun on our face, the, the touch of wood and leaves. Mm -hmm. um, is that, that, that helps us to connect back to earth with the touch, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and, and my, my son hated me this while we were while we're standing here talking to you all, right? So there yeah. you go, he knows, he knows, right? The, the talking stick. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the virtual or the, the for you an in person talk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we could we could do one of those Zoom um uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> things and we, we eat pass the off, stick. Off yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um is there any other I haven't got any other questions in here. I don't see any raised hands. Is there anything you'd like to close with, Wob? Um, no, just, just thank you very much to me, Gwetch, for this opportunity. I think this is a great idea. You know, this has really lifted my spirit to be able to connect with you all uh, today. Um, and yeah, it, it's, you know, these, these virtual meetings, and I think like, it's weird calling them virtual, like, it just, yeah. that sort of hints that they're not real, right? But like, yes. these are real connections that we're making right now. And I think we should, we should acknowledge that and really be thankful for these opportunities. Like if, if we didn't have this technology, and this was, occurring like if this was the spanish flu essentially right the things would be a lot different and yeah. and fortunately we have uh, this opportunity to to meet and to gather and to share stories and experiences together so uh big thanks to you janet joy and to to bill and to everybody else who organized this um you know i, I do believe we'll come out of this much stronger i believe we'll be in a better world at the end of this all and um I'm hoping for uh, a, a great uh, Mattawa River Writers Festival next year, where I'm sure to come as a as an audience member. So, uh, Chimigwech, thanks again, and big thanks to all of you for joining today. And um, hopefully, we'll all cross paths again soon. Thank you. I have a few final words. Um, our our next session is at one o'clock with Terry Campbell, who's going to facilitate yeah. a workshop to ignite your creative juices using storytelling as medicine. No. And there, there is a registration required as it is a Zoom ID number at this meeting. But I hope you will find a safe outdoor sit spot to reflect on our time with Wob today. So peace be with you. And I will now end our online connecting meeting. Thank you all. I'm going to.